Hi, everyone. We're going to wait just a couple of seconds while people filter into the panel. Okay, let's go ahead and get it started. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our virtual panel discussion, Antitrust in the Digital Age, a new technology call for new roles. I'm your host, Ashley Baker, and I'm Director of Public Policy at the Committee for Justice. This panel is co-hosted um, by the Committee for Justice and the Innovation Defense Foundation. I'd like to thank Dr. Brow for all of his work in helping bring this together. Um, and now I'm going to introduce our panelists in the order in which they're going to be speaking. So first we have Scott Walston. Scott is president and senior fellow at the Technology Policy Institute and also a senior fellow at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. He is an economist with expertise in industrial organization and public policy and his research, is, research focuses on competition, regulation, telecommunications, the economic of digitization and technology policy. He was the economics director for the FCC's National Broadband Plan and has been a lecturer at Stanford University's Public Policy Program, director of communications policy studies and senior fellow at the Progress and Freedom Foundation, a senior fellow at the AEI Brookings Joint Center for the Regulatory Studies, and a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, an economist at the World Bank, a scholar at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, and a staff economist at the U.S. President's Council of Economic Advisors. He holds a PhD in economics from Stanford University. Thomas Hazlitt is a Hugh McAuley Endowed Professor of Economics at Clemson University, where he also directs the Information Economy Project. He has previously served as Chief Economist of the FCC and in faculty positions at the University of California, Davis, Columbia University, the Wharton School, and George Mason University Scalia Law School. His research has appeared in numerous academic journals and law reviews, as well as popular periodicals. He has been a columnist at the Financial Times and is a founding partner of the consulting firm Arlington Economics. The New York Times recommended his 2011 volume as one of three books to read to understand the controversies surrounding net neutrality. His most recent book, The Political Spectrum, The Tumultuous Liberation of Wireless Technology from Herbert Hoover to the Smartphone, was featured as one of the top tech books of the year at CES 2018. And last but not least, Dr. Wayne Brow is currently president of the Innovation Defense Foundation. Previously, Dr. Brown was the chief economist at FreedomWorks. Prior to that, he worked at OMB, USAID, and in the research branch of an investment bank where he covered U.S. domestic policies. The IDF examines the importance of competition in open markets through the evolution of the internet, as well as addressing the impact of specific regulations. The IDF focuses on four core issue areas, permissionless innovation, internet governance, competition policy, and a balanced approach to intellectual property. A few brief housekeeping notes. So we're going to have the pa three panelists give brief presentations followed by Q&A. Um, for Q&A, if you could all kindly submit your questions to me through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen instead of you know, be calling on you, that would just be a lot easier. Um, and that will come after the discussion segment. So with that, Scott, the floor is yours. Um, well, thanks, Ashley, and thanks for inviting me to be here. Uh, I'm going first because I was the last one to uh, join the, the group, and so they voted that I would be first. Um, teach me a lesson to show up late. Uh, so, but thanks, Ashley. This is obviously very timely, uh, a timely issue. And I'll just make a few points uh, to start off. Uh, first, you know, we hear a lot about digital competition, um, competition of digital platforms and so on. I, I'm not sure it makes sense to think about that um, I'm not sure that context makes any sense, period. Uh, there's not something that's special about digital that necessarily requires a new approach to antitrust. I think generally they mean, um, people mean platforms when they say that, and particular platforms too. Uh, but, you know, a platform is not a, a market. It's not an antitrust market for sure. Uh, and um, if you want to think about antitrust issues, 
and I'm not saying that there, may, that there aren't any or that there may not be some, but you want to be able to define the markets well. And then you want to, you want to define those markets and look at whether those markets are competitive um, using it and, and where other companies can use some element of market power to keep them, uh, to, use, to use that market power anti-competitively. And so for example, cloud is, uh, is, one, is possibly one market where you have the, the biggest companies all competing against each other to offer cloud services and lots of smaller companies. Video streaming is another, retail is another, uh, and the, you know, the list goes on. And so to talk about antitrust, it, it, it's, it makes, I think, a lot more sense to talk about specific markets, to define specific markets, um, and look at those, each one, in fact, you know, market by market, that could be fact-based, uh, than to talk about digital. Um, and this is not a criticism of the panel. Um, we're talking about it because this is the way people are framing it now. Um, and I think it's, an, it's important to, for us to, to recognize that, um, that the debate needs to move more towards uh, you know, specific markets. So, and then, you know, once you do go a little more specific, uh, there's a the general claim that some platforms like social media uh, are monopolies and, and that they can prevent entry. And I, you know, I, I assume that's gonna be a, a focus of the hearings on Monday when the representatives all wanna make their speeches. Uh, but it's, it's, it, it, I think that reflects a mistaken view of, of monopolies and competition. It, there seems to be this idea that a competitor to Facebook, for example, has to be a Facebook clone. Uh, that seems to be the way Congress and, and others think about it. Um, obviously, more sophisticated people, even who, who think their market issues, don't necessarily think that, but you hear that frequently. But, you know, people multi-home, they have Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and, and maybe others at the same time. If you want to compete with Facebook, you don't create a Facebook clone. Google Plus is a good, a good example of how that doesn't work. Uh, you try to think of something else. And so what's the biggest competitor right now? That's probably TikTok. Uh, TikTok came out of nowhere, became one of the top social media sites, um, and that begins to suggest uh, uh, mar markets are that uh, competition happens around something something else. Uh, TikTok, as an aside, raises the interesting question of what happens when you have conflicting policy goals. So uh, Congress is also concerned about privacy issues and issues with respect to China, uh, and so TikTok is a focus there. But on the other hand, TikTok is also providing competition. So we want competition, and it came from TikTok but we're also concerned about TikTok. And I don't think anybody's co had a coherent way to address that issue. Um, now backing up a little bit, when you think about what, who competes with who, uh, that's really the basis of the attention economy. Uh, if the price of an activity is zero, you're still paying in, in time, your time. And the market is at least partly defined by how you spend your time doing, how, how, what, what, how you spend your time doing one thing affects your time doing another. So uh, for example, I think believe is the head of HBO, um, or maybe or Netflix, uh, he said he was more worried about um, competition from esports than about Netflix. Or maybe it was Netflix saying that about HBO. But the point is that competition can come from lots of places and it may not be for exactly the same thing. So I will, I will leave it there. Who goes second? Who came to the meeting second? <laughs> You want me to jump in? Yeah, Ashley, you're you're muted. Oh, sorry, I was trying to unmute you. Here we go. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yes, thanks very much for having me, and uh, uh, well wishes to everybody who's uh, uh, working from home and uh, uh, following following the rules. And uh, hopefully, uh, it'll all work uh, splendidly, and we'll soon be in a better spot. Uh, before long. So uh, let's talk um, a little bit about uh, digital platforms and what challenges there are for antitrust. Uh, there are no doubt challenges for antitrust, but this comes absolutely in every generation of the economy. And this has uh, been the long history of antitrust that extends prior to 1890 and the Sherman Act, but uh, just coming from the statutory era, uh, you can see that there were economies of scale that were new and interesting in the U.S. economy. They had to be adjusted to how we interpreted uh, uh, application of the, um, of the monopoly statutes. Uh, we come into the, the 1900s and national economies uh, for 
product distribution were very challenging uh, to competitive uh, ideals. And certainly there were these battles between the Sears Roebuck and, and the and the A&Ps and the old mom and pop uh, dry goods and grocery stores. And uh, in the 1930s, uh, the Robinson Patman Act was uh, very much of a reaction uh, to the conflicts between the, the uh, smaller localized monopolies from an earlier time and the more efficient, uh, lower priced, uh, standardized goods that were being sold by Sears, J.C. Penney's, and, uh, and, and, and nationally integrated uh, supermarket chains. Um, antitrust laws are still adopting, of course, in the IBM era with, uh, with, with computers and, and into the digital era. Certainly the uh, IBM case had a lot to do with bundling of uh, digital products, uh, programming and, and hardware. And then the, the Microsoft case comes in the late uh, part of the last century, which uh, in some cases is the opening of what people normally consider uh, the new era of digital economics, but they operate on the old rules. You can debate. I, love to debate how these cases went in terms of how successful or unsuccessful, uh, how we might have improved them. But um, the fact is that antitrust rules adjust and they have to adjust to the, to the, to the new market structures or they will become uh, useless or rather perverse. So that's the challenge we're in. Um, the categorical calls that we should rewrite the antitrust laws because we know about something better are unjustified. Clearly, um, as a general rule, we should always look for better tweaks of existing policy. And in fact, courts and all uh, kinds of legal institutions will try to get to a, to a better interpretation. And in fact, legislatures can be part of that. But so far, just throwing out certain forms of, of market competition, uh, the suggestion, for example, we outlaw vertical integration in some sort of categorical sense, um, has no practical implication, has no practical import, uh, and in fact, the market operates with ubiquitous vertical integration, and, and, and that has to be understood to see how uh, far-reaching and, and, and fundamentally irrelevant such, such calls are. In the digital economy, we can just sort of run through some of the very, very successful and important forms of integration. Go back to the start of the internet when we had the mass market access uh, it's a, to to um, you know the tech the the network technologies tomorrow come through with internet service providers like AOL, and of course many of these uh, innovations of the 1980s and 90s were vertically integrated. They gave you not only access to uh, uh, networks, uh, not not yet broadband, and that day narrowband networks. Uh, they they gave you access to networks and content, and they had walled gardens that they gave you a, a package deal. Now that faded away under the, the, um, the evolution of competition. There was no, re there was talk about regulatory um, intervention. There was no regulatory intervention. Uh, that, uh, that kind of progress was made because of um, competition coming in the market, of course, going back 20 years to the AOL Time Warner merger, there were assertions that uh, that, that, that merger, which was the biggest in history then and now, even 20 years later in dollar terms, uh, was going to somehow stymie um, development of the internet because it was uh, so, so, so massive and huge and would foreclose all kinds of uh, competing product. Uh, that challenged the AOL Time Warner monopoly, it proved to be um, uh, let's just use a nice word, overblown. Uh, the merger fell apart in the marketplace. AOL and uh, uh, Time Warner had to divest. And, uh, and of course, the entire broadband, the rise of broadband uh, coming out of the, the old cable market and then obviously encompassing telecommunications competition has really given us a much different space to call the internet. And so this, this kind of very simple example of vertical integration coming out of first the ISPs and then in, in, in the established television markets coming out of cable being allowed through regulatory liberalization to go into broadband networks and then actually force competition from the telcos that were supposedly on the cutting edge of technology to push us into the broadband space and the internet world to today. In fact, the internet world, which we're sitting on right now in response to a pandemic, having high speed networks that were not a part of any uh, 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 
a planned um, environment. Uh, certainly, we're not uh, anticipated by antitrust law. In fact, the, the regulators 20 years ago in AOL Time Warner got this substantially incorrect. The Federal Trade Commission did initially stop that merger and then put in these safeguards that proved totally irrelevant to try to, uh, you know, tr try to protect the market from what it said was a, a monopolistic uh, evolution by merger. Uh, th this comes about by having um, mostly um, humility about the, the extent of how the antitrust laws can advance. Uh, the, the consumer welfare and the competitive forces in the market. We should keep that humility. We should have good cases that make sense for consumers and in fact promote innovation, but we should not jump to eliminate efficient market structures and tides of creative destruction that in fact are challenging to some industries, supportive of others, but very, very helpful to consumers making choices in the marketplace. So, uh, let's hand it over to Wayne, I guess. Thank you, Tom. Wayne? Great. Th thank you, and thank everybody for attending. Uh, it's a, a good time to be talking about this. We have the, the House Judiciary Committee coming up with their study. They're having their hearing, and there's a study that's coming out on this. And the question is, do we need tougher antitrust enforcement for big tech? And I think if we look at markets and how markets work, it, that becomes a little bit tougher question because what we see in the marketplace are, are falling prices, increasing output, you have greater choice, better products, and we have more innovation. So all of those are, are questions, um, things that are helping consumers. And as long as we see these things, I think we should be a little bit careful about calling for greater enforcement of antitrust laws or, or going after these big tech companies in terms of either deconcentration or breaking them up or putting restrictions on, on, their, on their behavior. Um, and if, if you want to look at this, I, I think it might be useful just to look at sort of the economic side of this. A lot of this is tied up in the, the antitrust jurisprudence. But if, if you look at what economists were doing as antitrust laws sort of emerged, I, I think it's interesting. When the Sherman Act first passed, I don't think there was an economic theory underlying what Congress was doing when it came to regulating the, the trusts. Um, there was, you know, the, there's restrictions on trade were, were bad and monopolization were bad. But I think, you know, economists at, at that time who saw the economies of scale probably thought that some of the things that these firms were doing was okay. Um, but that, that sort of swept in through the political side of the, the, the issue. And it was followed by economists later coming up with this idea of how do you uh, analyze these firms that are in the business of, and they came up with something called structure conduct performance. And this was a way of looking at firms and how they were organized and what that entailed about whether they were competitive or not. And, and the structure was, how, what did the market look like? How many firms were involved? You know, what were they pr producing? Um, and, and that was, there was fairly good data on that. Conduct was how businesses behave. Um, that was a little bit murkier and it was hard to get good data on how that, that worked out. And performance was given the business and what they were producing in the market, how were they doing? Were they making money? Were they successful? And that framework, the structure of conduct performance framework sort of defined industrial organization from say the thirties up through the fifties and sixties. Um, but one of the problems is, is that is when it comes to conduct, we really don't know that much about how firms are behaving. The data was not there. So you typically ended up looking at the structure and the, the performance and sort of implying what the, what the conduct was. So if you were a, a, one of a few firms or the only firm and you were doing very well, it was likely that they would consider that a monopolistic practice rather than you're big and efficient and you're out be doing your competitors because you're just good at what you're doing. So that framework started to lead to some, some questionable outcomes. And by the 60s, you, you had economists that are really starting to question this. And, and of course, the Chicago School was a big part of it, but not just Chicago. There were economists at Harvard and Yale that are also looking at this and saying there, those, those sort of assessments may not be accurate and they may leading to, to poor performance and actually harming consumers in the marketplace. So they came up with this idea of, well, let's tie all of this to the consumer welfare standard. If we know that consumers are better off by what firms doing, it doesn't matter what their structure is, it doesn't matter what their, their conduct is, we know consumers are, are being served well by this market, so leave it alone. And that was, you know, that sort of led to this whole revolution in antitrust that started in the 70s, came, 
you know, in the, in the Reagan administration and that year it, it came very well ensconced. And it's funny because it's part of looking at this panel, I, I went back and pulled up my uh, Robert Bork's antitrust paradox. And, and it's funny because I had the 1993 edition and he wrote a new introduction there where he sort of apologized for the tone he used in the first one because he was very acerbic and kind of gloomy about antitrust law. 1993, he thought everything was fixed and you know the, the consumer welfare standard was ensconced and everything was good. But if we look today, even I think he's, he's right to be going back to his first version of that book because we do have people that see antitrust enforcement as something we need to ramp up and particularly with, the, with the, these uh, digital platforms. And, and so what I wanted to do is, is just look at, you know, how we, how we assess these, these platforms in, in terms of economics and in terms of antitrust power. And some of the things I see are that like, there's probably three big areas where there's potential that I see the House Judiciary Committee or, you know, antitrust activists going after. And one is digital advertising. I, I think we've already seen Europe, we've seen Australia coming down on, on firms for especially Google saying that they're, they're sort of in, in a monopolistic position and, and, and exploiting the market power with respect to advertising. Um, I, I think if you look at the market, you know, you, you can go to the Fred tables and pull out the price of, of digital advertising and it's been plummeting. So I, I'd be very skeptical of rushing in there too soon. Nonetheless, Australia and the EU and the UK seem to be moving in that direction. Another area where I, I see potential issues is is the these the app stores that are, are developed um, there's a lot of there's lawsuits against the apple and, and and there's people complaining that both google and apple and their app stores are extracting above market rates for for allowing people to put their their software in those app stores um, so again i think that's an area but i think you know you have to think about again serving the consumer and consumers seem to be very well off uh, producers are, and developers have a, a, a an outlet where they can put their products without having to do their own brick and mortar sales, without having to do their own website sales. So, so there is benefits they get from using these, these, these stores that, that, that both Android and Apple use. And the final area where I see so, some potential is this, this whole notion of, of acquisitions and, and you know, the, this worry that every time something that can be a potential competitor to Google or Apple or Facebook, um, suddenly is bought up and so you never get the real kind of competition that, that you're looking for. Um, but again, I, I, I think that's in, a lot of times that's hindsight is 2020 because if you look at these firms, um, nobody knows beforehand if Instagram is going to be a super hit or Snapchat, something that, that needs to be bought. Or, so I think, you know, hindsight, it says, yeah, these were great products. We should have let them develop. But a lot of these guys, you know, these innovators, they have a great idea, but they may not have a business model. So to get that innovation, having someone buy them is probably a good thing. So, so I think we have to be very careful and I'll, I'll just leave it at that and sort of maybe we can open up to questions, but I, I think those are the areas I see potential threats coming forward. Thank you, Wayne. Um, so for the discussion, I, I don't even know where to pick up. There's there's so much here, you know, that needs to needs to be covered. And obviously, during the um, hearing on Monday, they will only kind of crack the surface of that or attempt to. We will see. Um, there are just a lot of really, you know, big questions regarding market definition and mergers and acquisitions and vertical integrations. Um, why don't we start where Wayne left off with? Um, mergers and acquisitions, you, you were talking about how, you know, it's kind of perceived that these companies can never grow to compete because they're always, um, you know, being bought out by the larger company. Um, what exactly do you see, you know, what are the proposals right now when it comes to like merger restrictions and um, market cap and um, what is the state of play um, regarding that issue? I, I, can say, I mean, there, there's there's suggestions of, of if you're above a certain percent of market share, then you're not allowed to, to buy smaller firms. And I, I think, you know, those are the kinds of questions that are being kicked around. I think Europe's kicked them around a little bit. Um, we're talking about it. But I, I think one of the things to remember when you're talking about this is if you don't allow these kinds of things to go on and if you force this deconcentration into the market, there's things that happen. And one is you're not allowing resources to be pushed to their highest value use. So that means there's going to be consumer harm in, involved in that transaction. The second part of that is if you do this, by definition, the administrative state grows because things that were once 
overseen by market forces and market behavior are now going to require an administrative effort to say whether or not it's a good thing. So on that front, front um, you see this, you know, everybody's been concerned about the size of the administrative state. And this only adds to that, that, uh, that overall size. And then finally, um, I think people make mistakes. And in, in, when we're talking at this scale, if regulators make a mistake, it's very costly. And, you know, consumers don't get the benefits that are, are potentially available in the marketplace. Yeah. And I mean, this is a uh, merger, uh, merger decisions are, can be complicated and having any kind of single uh, a rule that's supposed to cover all circumstances or uh, any arbitrary rule uh, above, you know, setting market shares just um, isn't, isn't make, isn't going to make sense. And it doesn't fit with a fact-based approach to antitrust policy. Uh, people frequently, talk about, um, they say that Facebook or Google um, or any of the big tech companies will buy, comp buy uh, firms that they think might be competitors with them someday. And they say that's the reason why we should restrict it. But, you know, the, the other side of that is that, of course, being acquired is the reason, that, one reason that people um, enter the markets in the first place. And it's not as if people start companies because they want to be the, you know, mom and pop Instagram store on the corner. Uh, they hope to, their, their exit strategy is, is important. And the harder you make it to, uh, to exit the market, the less, likely, or the, you know, the less likely it will be, or the harder it will be to raise money to enter the market too. And the discussions don't seem to take into account um, those, uh, that, that side of it. And if we care about long run innovation, which is the main thing we care about, in addition to consumer welfare, because innovation is important to consumer welfare, then that's important, a, a key part of it. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, just to expand on that, I mean, we already have antitrust policies that are very uh, uh, guarded about the large mergers, certainly, and large market shares in any identified market. And, um, and, and so if you have these, you know, you, in 2018, you had uh, Amazon buying uh, Whole Foods. And of course, there was a, a fairly long and involved process as to whether or not that was uh, uh, anti-competitive. Um, you know, Whole Foods with a very tiny share of the retail uh, food market in the United States, but obviously a, uh, uh, an important brand name and a, and a, and a business model in, uh, in health foods. And um, there were, um, you know, the, the, the pros and cons on that. The, the merger was allowed to go through. There was a lot of opposition. The New York Times editorialized against it. There was you know, straight to monopoly from, from, you know, in that segment of the market. Now, that, that has been a very poor prediction. In fact, the, uh, the competitors um, uh, in, in the grocery uh, business, including Walmart and Kroger, and then the emergence of Instacart, uh, as a delivery service have done very, very well over the last uh, two, two years of the, um, uh, of the combination on the other side. Um, but but um, God bless them for all being nervous and crazy nervous about Walmart, excuse me, about Amazon uh, combining with Whole Foods. Um, of course, the joke on that one is uh, how could Whole Foods raise, raise their prices to monopoly levels given where they started? But uh, the, uh, the, the fact is that um, you want the marketplace to actually uh, make these kinds of judgments in, in, and certainly for the startup world, they want to be able to, uh, uh, to have the option to sell a small company to a big company. So these blanket rules that, uh, you know, if you have a large firm, you can't buy the little firms. There's been some large internet company, Cisco comes to mind, that they, they basically made a business model out of buying up a lot of smaller technologies and then uh, somehow expertly integrating that technology with their bigger structure. It's not very easy to do. And in fact, most of the, of the firms we, we look at are not uh, you know, if you look at the, a, a Netflix or a Google uh, or a Microsoft, uh, uh, mergers are very, even Facebook, uh, really a very small part of this. When they, when, they, when they make these mergers, they buy small companies with very little in revenue. And in fact, if you have rules against that and you just want to, you know, blanket prohibit, then, then uh, you are in a situation to tell the startups, uh, unless, uh, you know, uh, un unless you can completely outcompete the incumbent, you're, you're, you're toast. And on the other side of it, you tell the incumbents, okay, don't try to buy this, this company for a billion dollars on the side, just go recreate it. 
and they might recreate it for two billion dollars, which is why they buy it for a billion. But you know, if they're a big company and they're looking at an upstart that has a good idea and they're watching them, they're not going to sit back and just say, "Okay, we'll let them take our market." Uh, it's not not clear that they can they can suppress that uh, outcome, but they certainly will have incentives then uh, to vertically integrate themselves and and to uh, not uh, you know allow the, the so-called startup market to uh, uh, to prosper as, as as Scott was noting. Uh, so I um, yeah I see these uh, you know challenges we have today is is really misinterpreted. And one one you know looking at the Amazon platform, it's uh, uh, almost taken as a matter of faith now that Amazon is a threat. It has a conflict because it has this platform for selling retail, and it's a wonderfully efficient platform, and they've invested very, very strongly in it uh, for many, many years, taking negative returns and, and, and pouring money back into the uh, consumer interface, assuring consumers they had excellent uh, search and uh, customer service and low prices and uh, a wide range of choice on the platform. And now they are um, uh, uh, and now accused of, of suppressing, get, get using the information about all the third party vendors on their system to undersell them and predate uh, them out of the market. Well, it just turns out that that is completely in violation of the empirical evolution of the company. 1997, of all the products sold on Amazon, essentially 100% are Amazon products. Today, approximately 40% are Amazon products. In fact, Amazon has become the trillion dollar super competitor in the marketplace retail on the growth of its third party platform. That's where they're making their trillion dollars of capital value right now. And there's no question about the direction of the company and the efficiency of the company in providing sales um, and, uh, and, and customer support and shipping and efficiencies that are not available elsewhere, including on totally pure play third party sites like eBay, which was much stronger, much larger in the 2000s. And of course, which does not have the conflict of selling its own products. It's, a, it's, it's, it's totally devoted to third party. Not that eBay isn't a great company, is not, they're, they're still a great competitor. New ones have arisen, you know, arisen including um, Shopify. Walmart uh, now has the people who, who had been uh, at, at um, Amazon and it had been purchased in what was alleged to be a predatory action to take a small company out of the market, a company called diapers.com, by the way, that those entrepreneurs are not only billionaires right now, they're running the e-commerce program. Mark Lohr is the name of the, the lead on that, running e-commerce for Walmart in opposition to Amazon. So the resources are playing very, very competitively in a Schumpeterian game of creative destruction Prices are going down, services are going up, there's an expansion of opportunity. We see it dramatically, of course, during the pandemic when so many services have, 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 have gone online and, 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 and you know, in-person retail has, has, has been dealt a, uh, you know, a body blow by the, by the lockdowns and, um, and the medical uh, threats. And um, you know, the efficiencies of these social opportunities uh, would be uh, threatened by blanket rules prohibiting these kinds of very, very productive pro-social uh, programs for, for, you know, for the public. And I think you've all raised some really great points regarding particularly smaller companies and entrepreneurs. Um, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs start companies as they want to be acquired. And that is one of the biggest reasons, reasons to start a company. And no one's really building the next Google or building the next search engines they're kind of looking, you know, forward to the next next things that's already been done. Um, and one point that I think is not really emphasized enough in this debate is how it does affect these smaller companies um, equally, if not more than the larger companies, these potential policies. But doesn't it also drain venture capital investments? Is that another area of concern? I, I feel like, you know, the well, start- Absolutely, any, any form of, on any form of, of investment that sees its uh, potential route for success in the market foreclosed by by a policy that's inefficient is going to be truncated. So you certainly, when you when you're a startup and you're you're pitching for seed money and then venture capital and and additional financing to get to your IPO or whatever your liquidation event is, uh, you are very cognizant of what your options are in terms of 
all the panoply of opportunities, including merger. And you want to foreclose those opportunities. I mean, just, just go back to right now, what is a very, very important and impressive competition between Walmart e-commerce and, uh, and, and Amazon. Now, it's, it's, it's said in, in Lena Khan's 2017 article in the um, Yale Law Journal that's um, been, been uh, quite influential, has a central story about predatory conduct by Amazon, which I just referenced, where, where Amazon was alleged between uh, 2005 and 2010 to be watching very carefully diapers.com come onto its platform and be quite successful, and then making an offer and buying out that company. They, they made capital gains, this, this, this allegedly, um, you know, this, this predatory action by Amazon uh, gave $400 million in capital gains to the founders of this little startup that did operate by selling on Amazon. And then they took that company internally. That only lasted for a couple of years before those founders went back on the market, founded another company called Jet.com. It was in 2016 that that company was purchased by Walmart for $3.3 billion, total e-commerce, straight up anti-Amazon play. And now the head of that company, which you originally had started uh, diapers.com, Mark Lohr is one of the most successful tech entrepreneurs in history. He is running e-commerce for Walmart. Now all of this happened by acquisitions, acquisitions by Amazon and acquisitions uh, and a startup in between by Walmart. And, uh, and, and, and this is how, uh, the competitive landscape is moving forward and, and, and delivering, you know, literally hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars worth of consumer welfare benefits to the public. And these are sharpened uh, quite naturally because of the increased demands and stress on the system by the current situation with, with, with lack of access and, and uh, social mixing. And, uh, you know, two, two situations, retail situations requiring social mixing. So uh, th this is a very, very obvious and impressive outcome. It's one of countless others. And it is entirely, it seems, overlooked in the debate about what we should do about threats to competition through merger. We already have a regime that is working. I would just say one last thing. There's been a lot of talk about the fact we can compare cellular telephone markets pretty easily across the world because they're fairly standard. The technologies are similar. And uh, many have argued that if we look to Europe, the Europeans are doing much better on antitrust. But the United States has a lower concentration ratio and has consistently for many years, certainly than the average European country, and even than some of the big success stories, which are alluded to, like Germany, the German government allowed a four to three merger in 2013. And the United States still does not have a four to three market. We had a merger proposed and then there was um, uh, a compromise put together to save a fourth competitor, so to speak, uh, in, the, in the aftermath of uh, T-Mobile Sprint over the, over the past year. But the United States has less concentration and has, uh, while we have, um, in, in non-quality adjusted terms, we have fairly high prices in the U.S. for access uh, to wireless markets. There is no question we have much more uh, use of our systems, have much more data, and have better networks than any than the average system in Europe. And there's a there's a few few European uh, uh, markets and and a couple of Asian markets that have done well. Uh, Finland uh, has a lot of spectrum out, has done really well, but the United States is absolutely at the top of the list for utilization of high speed internet access over wireless. And, um, you know, it's not close to compared to some of these other countries that we're being compared to in Europe or Asia. And our antitrust policy, uh, whatever it is, good or bad, has done relatively well in terms of that competition where you can compare. Uh, discrete markets in mobile services. So before we move too far away from the venture capital question, I, I do want to um, acknowledge that uh, that the effects can be complicated too. I, I don't want to make it sound like we're just setting up straw men. Uh, so, you know, you can imagine that, uh, uh, that venture capitalists will be, you know, uh, you know they, they want to, they want to invest in companies that have the possibility for uh, lucrative exits. So they want to sell their companies. Um, you know, but they could also be, uh, they, it's conceivable that they might see a signal that uh, a, a big company buys some of the, a company, a small company in a particular industry that makes them less likely to, uh, to invest in something because they're worried about co competing directly with Facebook or, or so on. I'm not saying that's how it will 
turn out necessarily. I'm just saying that there are competing incentives and this will ultimately be an empirical question. I just want to make sure we're not, um, we're not, we're not painting people who uh, think differently as, as just ridiculous um, because there are some things uh, to, to think about. I think those are good points. Um, and kind of shift things though to one of the bigger questions I think some people are grappling with right now. And it's, you know, the traditional problem with monopolies is that they you know, raise prices and restrict output and therefore that harms consumers. But then now you have these digital platforms that you know, are under investigation right now, which you know, are available to the consumer for free. So how does antitrust um, you know, address that situation? And also like with zero price point, like how do you identify consumer harm? So, I mean, one thing is, uh, though there's, um, there's of course been a lot of research on uh, how do we how do we deal with the zero price industries and uh, zero price markets, and also uh, how we measure improvements in you know how we do price indices, how do we measure improvements in, in industries where prices are uh, are, are often zero. Uh, Carol Corrado, in particular, has a lot of interesting um, research on this, and especially in some new work, has shown that prices in these in these markets. Um, have fallen uh, not just more, have fallen uh, by a lot compared to, especially compared to the CPI, which of course has increased, um, but also fallen by more than people had thought they had fallen. Uh, so it's, it's really in intriguing, it's intriguing work. Um, and, and also, uh, you know, sometimes it's funny to hear various presentations on things like this because they'll say, uh, someone might say, you know, Apple, Google, uh, Apple, Google, Facebook, they have such high profit margins, therefore they, um, they, they must be a monopolist. And then they'll say, but Amazon, of course, has low, you know, has low profit margins. They didn't make any profits at all until recently. And then they'll say, but that's a different case. Um, so, you know, if you make too much money, you're a monopolist. And if you don't make enough money, you're also a monopolist. Uh, and obviously, I've been grossly generalizing here. Uh, but, um, but that's what happens with the lack of, of, a, of a rigorous, coherent way to, to think about an issue. And I, I'd like to just point out, in addition to what Scott's used to, that um, we do tend to group these guys together, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, but they're actually very different companies and they have different strategies, different models. And, and we have to take that in, into account when we talk about what's the market power of each of these indiv individual firms. And to just blankly talk about uh, big tech, I, I think it does a disservice to what, what needs to be done when we look at these. And, and, and a lot of these, they, they do have two-sided markets and, and it may be a zero price to consumers, but that means they're, they're pushing all the costs onto the advertisers on the other end and, and the web publishers. So, so you have to consider not just the, the, the consumer benefits or, and consumer costs, but also what's, what's on the other side of that two-sided market. And, and that's the goal of, of uh, profit maximizers to figure out how you div divide that, that cost between those two sides of the market. If I could also just uh, uh, make a note on, on Scott saying that it's, you know, it's an empirical question about the venture capital. You can, uh, you know, you can, you can see it as a positive to have the uh, merger takeout as a, as a liquidity event. And um, that helps get funding for the, for the startup. Uh, you can also have the established firm uh, looming as a, as, as a dark threat uh, to uh, you know, to take out to take out the entrance, um, the um, and 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 that's correct. Um, but 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 as soon as you stated it, uh, I you know the venture the, those those opportunities are very difficult uh, uh, to to make credibly for uh, established mm -hmm. firms without without the aid of some regulatory barriers. That is, that is absolutely true. And we, and, we, and we know that in antitrust as well, because of course that was, was part of the problem with the old AT&T, the common carrier regulated AT&T had lots of regulatory levers to, to manipulate and, and then to throw down. And that did stop uh, startups and uh, uh, you know, venture capital going in and challenging the AT&T monopoly. And, and that was part of the antitrust case against AT&T and that was, that was important, and we see that certainly all the time in wireless as well. That you you really dis discourage innovation right off the bat. Why why go after some kind of um, um, you know opportunity when when in fact the regulatory barriers are going to be there, and you're not going to get past that. And so those those are discouragements in terms of the innovation. But it you know it seems to me that we have to be very realistic about what kinds of threats you know, these, these, these firms pose and, uh, you know, cause, cause we see all the time that in fact, large established firms are threatened by startup companies that come in and take part of their, 
uh, you know, part of their market by, by focusing on something that the large company just can't do by the nature of, of their present commitments. And, and we certainly see it. I mean, the innovator's dilemma is all about that very, very well established problem with the, the incumbents fending off uh, uh, what comes next. And then, you know, you see it, you, you see it in, in actual real world uh, markets where something like Netflix comes absolutely out of nowhere to topple Blockbuster. And it's just, it's, it's just inconceivable that just having an online interface uh, can can bring down a company that was judged way back in 1999 and 2004 to have so much market power it wasn't going to be allowed to to merge with video rental companies like Hollywood, Hollywood Video, yeah. mm-hmm. and um, that's 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 just 15 years ago. And then of course five years later, uh, Blockbuster, the giant Blockbuster, is is in bankruptcy receivership, and you know. Netflix, you know, rules the world. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're the startup that didn't need a merger. They, they literally crushed the, the much larger, uh, the much larger firm. So before we move on to one or two questions for, from the audience, um, can we talk a little bit about the role of data in theories of monopolization? And you hear a lot of people saying, you know, Google or whatever other company has um, too much data that doesn't, you know, what impact does that have on whether or not um, they technically are a monopoly? So yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll start this one. Um, it's kind of an interesting debate because it, it also often goes with uh, calls for data to be held um, more securely and not be shared. Um, and of course, if you don't want data to be shared and you also think that data uh, access to data is a barrier to entry, then you're advocating rules that would you know, uh, keep those um, those barriers to, to entry in place. But you know, it's, I don't believe that it's just data. Um, you, need, you need to be able to use the data. You need to be able to, um, you, uh, and, and that requires lots and lots of resources, not just um, access to cloud, which of course now anybody has because you're, you can pay for it, you can buy it from all kinds of companies. But you also need to have um, the, the, the engineering skills and the computer skills uh, to, to, to use that somehow. Um, and also, you know, a lot of the data uh, doesn't necessarily, isn't particularly useful after a short period of time. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's hard to see how data itself uh, is, is a large barrier to entry. I think there's actually, um, from about a year ago, there's a really interesting um, Andreessen Horowitz article I'd um, encourage people in the audience to read about the utility of data moats. Um, I'm not mm-hmm. sure if you've read that one about, you know, how it eventually has diminishing returns, which you have, you know, the amount of data that you can, you know, reasonably use to help your profit model. There, let's see, we have a few questions here. One said, this discussion, while insightful, presumes that Congress would be trust busters are actually concerned and can that Congress and would-be trust busters are actually concerned about consumer harm. Please comment on the likelihood that this latest antitrust crusade is the most convenient or malleable means of regulating platforms for political purposes. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know why that, if, if I said something, uh, then I'll be happy to say that, no, that wasn't, that, that is not the idea that I assume that Congress is going to be pro-consumer welfare and what it enacts. And in fact, the, the 1890 Sherman Act was, it come up as a topic of conversation. The uh, Eider Tarbell, the muckraker, uh, wrote a very nice book, uh, The Tariff in Our Times, where she accused the Republican Congress of uh, simply um, uh, enacting a fairly um, uh, inert and inept uh, Sherman Act, very general language, uh, wouldn't do much, uh, as an opening salvo in its push to raise tariffs. And in fact, the biggest legislative uh, docket uh, that that Congress was the McKinley tariff that came up uh, four months after the, the Sherman Act was passed and, and, and indeed raised tariffs so much that government revenues fell. And that was by design. We wanted to block in a protectionist way manufacturing from coming into the United States. And this was the, uh, the, the agenda at the time. So anyway, you can be anti-consumer welfare and still pass a, 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 an antitrust act. Um, yeah, I, th- I think that uh, as economists, I want to talk about consumer welfare because I think that that is relevant. And uh, if you um, have an idea that the laws are there to protect uh, the competitive process, the only semblance of rationality that you have in promoting that 
is to talk about the gains to consumers in the short run and the long run, and that in, in certainly in, embodies the competitive process and the innovative process. And uh, I think that people who are analytical about this uh, and, and, and serious about the social implications of the law should focus on that. I think it's also the politics are an interesting point. I um, mean, if I take off my economist hat and put on my uh, guy shooting the breeze hat, um, that you know, this is an interesting period in time where it's uh, this seems like uh, the, the, this, um, these new views on antitrust seem like something that's more comes from the left, but it's also a time when people on the right uh, are also upset at the platforms, and so for different reasons maybe, but uh, so they, there's um, much more of an agreement than there normally is. Uh, and so that's, that's helped this debate along. How, it, how far it actually goes though is an interesting question because at the end of the day, politicians need these platforms too. Um, you know, if you go to any of their websites, they're all using all the data trackers. Um, they all want to be able to target ads uh, in their elections. Um, so, uh, so we'll see how far this goes. And I, I would just say, I mean, this is, it, it is an important issue, and there, there is this push sometimes to say, well, Europe is, is, is much more considerate of, of firms in the marketplace rather than protecting competition. They'll protect, say, small businesses. Or, and I, I think it gets very tricky when you do that. Um, but obviously, um, and I think right now we see big tech as the, the, the target of a lot, a lot of this. But in general, I think if you look at antitrust law, there's never a consistent winner or loser. So it's always gonna be one industry that catches the public's eye that, that and for, for today, I think it's technology, obviously, because the social platforms are, are so widely used that, that and, and there's these political debates about privacy, everything that, that these platforms do that has nothing to do with antitrust. And I think we should keep it that way. But there is this, you know, there is this notion, at least in antitrust law, if we're using whatever standard we're using, we're not always seeing a consistent set of winners and losers. And that's why I think over time, we'll, we'll do the right thing. But we have to, you know, as an economist, I would say doing the right thing means making sure we're maximizing consumer welfare. But there is, there is a consistent loser, uh, according to the European Union, the European manufacturers. And they, the, the fact is that uh, the U.S. has seen uh, to dominate now with uh, some uh, rising uh, uh, influence from Chinese-based, China-based companies. But the, um, you know, when you mentioned before about the criticism of, say, the Apple platform, well, I, I immediately uh, recalled the 2001, 2002, when you had Apple revolutionize content on the internet, uh, first with music and iTunes, uh, integrating with the iPod. And this was attacked by the European authorities as an anti-competitive, um, monopolistic, vertical restriction that you'd have to go to the iTunes store for your content. And um, the enormous advantages that, that I mean, cleaning up that market, that was, that was the, the virus uh, intellectual property theft market of all time. Uh, and uh, you had, um, you know, Napster and Grokster and all kinds of uh, uh, controversy and, and um, what, what uh, you know, Apple brought to that to have a legal uh, orderly, non-virus uh, infested market. And of course it spilled out into many other competitive platforms. And, uh, but that was attacked instantly. It's an American innovation. The, the companies are not from here. And um, the Europeans have had this uh, opportunity. It's, you know, a lot of studies have shown how they're uh, biased in favor of European firms against non-European uh, in their antitrust actions. And um, I, did, I did notice in the last annual, uh, Trend, internet trends report by Mary Meeker. She takes the top 30, as she defines them, the top, the world's top 30 internet firms. Only one of the top 30, and it's number 30, uh, is is based in Europe. It's uh, it's in Sweden, Spotify, and um, you know for whatever reason we could get to that on another uh, you know webinar perhaps. But uh, the Europeans are not doing well uh, in in this kind of um, uh, competition. Uh, industrially, and um, and 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 taking those shots is is absolutely politically straightforward. You don't use your mini towel every day, Tom. <laughs> I do remember mini towel. <laughs> I had a friend in in Paris who loved it. Yeah. No, but but I think Tom, you're absolutely right. I mean, if you look at how Europe enforces antitrust, clearly. 
Um, there's no cost to them af of going after American firms and billion dollar fines have become sort of commonplace against American tech companies. And, and there, um, and that's when you get away from the consumer welfare standard, um, you will get to this point where you have consistent winners and losers because there um, you're just creating a system that's open to rent seeking and those who are effective are gonna use that system to keep out competitors and uh, kill their rivals. And that um, leads me to the last question we have, which um, is about the consumer welfare standard. And this is pretty impossible to answer in five minutes. So I'll let you just give, you know, 30 seconds of concluding thoughts um, about this. But um, what do you think of efforts by some to try and move away from the consumer welfare standard? For example, what is your take on a total welfare model? Yeah, I'll uh, jump in by saying that uh, on a historical basis, I. I have written and 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 so it's not I'm agreeing. Others I, I suppose are are buying into the same argument that a lot of what happened in the Sherman Act was not consumer welfare standard, but the argument now is that that's the best way to interpret it and the only reasonable way, and that is true. And in fact, I'll I'll go I'll give you the example. In Lena Khan's uh, 2017 Yale Law Journal paper, she talks about predatory conduct, which she alleges happens quite routinely with the. Uh, Amazon platform and says that uh, Amazon is wiping out these um, the third party sellers and then replacing them and then raising prices. Now, of course, she has to make that argument. I don't think the argument is compelling on an empirical basis, but she has to make the argument that at the end of the day, the consumers are going to lose something from that. That's the logical way to think about it. If you go a different way and say that I have some secret model of what's going to benefit the world and I can't really show you that it helps consumers, you're going to naturally shift away from protecting consumers and come up with a very anti-consumer program, but which, by the way, was the explicit goal of Brandeis. Uh, Louis Brandeis was anti-consumer and said that it was a, a, the stupid consumers who are buying cheap and just buying the best products and they were putting the little guys out of business. He was there to protect the little guys with a lot of inefficiencies against the big guys and um, that was his social mission. Well, that's, that's, that's pretty hostile to, to the plight of the average customer and, and in fact low income uh, individuals and hostile to innovation and the progress of the whole system. So that's where you end up if you really throw out consumer welfare. Are there any other quick concluding thoughts? We have about two minutes here. I think that was a good, that was a good summary. Exactly. The consumer welfare standard, I, I think is, is, especially from an economics perspective, it's the, the, probably the cleanest way to uh, assess these things. And it's a way that provides the society the greatest benefit. So um, I just think we need to be wary of, of calls to move to something else. I completely agree. I mean, from, from a legal standpoint, we've had two webinars about this before and have some other work on it as well. Um, there are certainly some concerns about moving away from the um, consumer welfare standard. And I'm happy to, you know, if anyone wants to follow up, I'm happy to show you some resources on that as well. That's um, definitely worthy of another, you know, hour talk and more time than we have here. Um, but that is all that we have time for today. Thank you all for coming out. And thank you so much for our panelists um, and to our co-host. Um, it was really great having you. That was a really insightful conversation. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.